Hello. Okay, so I think I have to talk into this for... It's a record. Yeah, but I don't think you need it for... Ah, okay. Yes, talk loudly. I we have to get an hour done this way. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. How are you feeling? It's 9 a.m. on a Sunday. I'm very happy to see each one of you because I was like, there's going to be three people in this talk. Um, so I'm extremely excited, so thank you. Um, yeah, I got super sick last year. I was sick for five days, and I was quarantined in London, and they would not let me fly back <laughs> home. I had to stay in a hotel. So yeah, I'm glad to be here this time without getting as sick. Um, so this talk has been kind of inspired like over probably the last year, year and a half, just a bunch of different... So I guess I'll back up and say, okay, so I've been doing container stuff since like the sub 1.0 release of Docker. And now at Red Hat, I, I am the product manager. I'm like the primary product manager that drives our container images. So like I build the Red Hat Enterprise Linux base images, which are now UBI, Red Hat Universal Base Image, um, which I'll talk to about a little bit in place. But, but um, so I think about this stuff all the time, and I get a ton of questions around this. And I'm also the product manager for Cryo. And I don't, how many of you know what Cryo is? All right. I won't bore you with it, but it's still cool that some of you know. And then how many of you know what Podman is? More. Okay, that's good, because I'm also the product manager for that. And then Builda and Scopio. And it used to be Docker when we, well, still technically, I guess, because we, we do support in RHEL 7, so I'm still the product manager for Docker as well. Um, but, yeah, so I basically eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff for, like, the last five years. And so this started culminating in my mind. All right, like, I'll, I'll, I'll get into it, but the, 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 there's, like, this, I don't know, every time something new comes out, everybody says, oh, the old thing's dead, and now there's this new thing, and everything, nobody cares about the old thing, and it's just, like, how people, I don't know, the last, this is, like, maybe politics, this is technology, this is everything, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, so I published a blog entry on, uh, on opensource.com, and it was fairly popular, it was decent, it did pretty well, and so, like, I was like, yeah, maybe I should do this as a talk. I think I was talking with you, and you actually told me I should do a talk, and I was like, oh, I guess I should do that. Um, and then it's a culmination of that and the fact that I found, I came upon this. So it's an interesting comment or co uh, it's an interesting um, concept where people undervalue, like like in economics, there's the concept of discounting, right? Like you'll subconsciously discount certain things and then you will overvalue other things. So like you know, like if you see a lion, you're gonna run away from the lion, but then you could starve to death because you discounted the fact that you actually also had to go get food. Um, people discount maintenance. So like. I used to say, until somebody corrected me, that like, you know, when a bridge is built, people have a tuxedo dinner, and then when, they, when the road crew comes in to resurface it 20 years later, nobody cares, right? Like, they get Taco Bell or, or kebab, you know, at the end of the day. But, but I was corrected by a, a civil engineer that said they definitely do not get tuxedo dinners because apparently they can barely pay for bridges. So now I use, like, the skyscraper example, right? Like, when a bank builds a skyscraper because they have a lot of money, I'm guessing there's a tuxedo dinner. But... We value innovation, and we even do this everywhere that I've seen. Even in our planning meeting last week, I noticed, like, everyone claps when we're doing this new thing, and everyone claps. But then when, like, we fix the old thing, everyone's like, oh, that's cool. But, like, we don't care. Like, and so, like, I started going through on mine. I'm like, ooh, I mean, we basically undervalue what's in the container image because it's essentially a, a Linux distribution. And so I've, I've seen this multiple times from people, Twitter, Twitter drives me crazy, but this is probably a quote I've seen on Twitter more than, more than once. Like, how many of you care about the operating system? All right, I can leave. I'm done. <laughs> All right. I've already cut to the chase. Um, uh, you'll see this comment, like, especially people with containers. The, and, and I guess, how many of you were in Daniel Reek's talk yesterday? Any of you? One, okay, a couple. So he talked about how there's two ways to look at an operating system. I almost stole a slide, but I decided I'd talk about this anyway. Uh, you know, you can look at it from the bottom up, and you can look at the operating system as enabling the hardware. And, like, you know, the Linux kernel can enable certain pieces of hardware, blah, blah, blah. But then when you run your app, it looks the same no matter what kind of hardware, as long as it's, like, x86 hardware or ARM or power or whatever. Uh, but, you know, given different architectures, it looks the same. And then you can look at it from the top down, which is something that I'm a systems person, so it's not something that I had historically done early in my career. I looked at it always from the bottom up. But, but top down, you look at it as an application platform where if I write my app once, it should work in other places, right? Um, mostly for this talk, I am going to tackle it from the top down because I think, I think we all know that like you still need a Linux kernel to boot up hardware. But 
we're moving to cloud and everybody's talking about how you're running like containers on you know cloud platform that is a vm that's a fairly generic vm and it is fairly easy to light up because they're pretty standard so i think the more interesting problem for at least developers and and people that are thinking about this is is in the container and i think this is where people are really blind to the fact that it still matters so let's start with something not technical and then i'm going to hurt your brains in the middle and then i'll calm down again and stop hurting your brains but um Let's use tires in as an example. I joke like, how many of you have kids? So how many of you care about your tires? <laughs> how many of you would have said that before I asked you if you had kids? <laughs> like, we don't think about it, right? Like, okay, so a minivan is one thing. This is a very common vehicle in the US. I know you guys don't have as many here, but, but, the, but the idea that when I hear people say, well, I don't care about the operating system, or they're like, I don't care about my tires. I'm like, eh, I think you do. Like, if you have a family in your car, I think you care about the tires. I think it gets, especially in the winter, rain, I think, it, I think you start to go, oh, there are certain variables I do care about with the tires, right? Like, I don't just want them to, like, blow out when we're on the expressway and, like, crash the car off the road, right? So I care somewhat. Like, I at least care a little bit. And then I go, well, here's a higher-end car. Do you care about your tires with this? Like, how many of you own, like, sports sedans? None of you. So he might care a little bit. I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, these just came over to the U.S., I think. And they're stupid expensive there, too. Um, but then you move into, you start getting into this territory. It's not quite professional, but I think these, I don't own one of these. I don't think any of us do. Does anyone own a Ferrari? All right, good. I, I'm talking to my people. But I think, I think they care about their tires. I would think that once you have that much money, you don't care. Like, you're, you're like, just give, give me the best tires, put new ones on, I'm done. And then when you're in this scenario, you definitely care about the tires, right? And I would argue this is where we should be thinking if we're professionals. So, like, how many of you do any kind of, like, computer stuff for a living? Like, work? Okay, exactly. So, like, we should all be thinking in this category, right? Like, you would never go to an F1 mechanic who's like, yeah, I don't care about the tires. I care about the new carbon fiber wings we're putting on this. We, nobody says that. Like, if you're a professional, you worry about all the components that go into that, you know, thing that you're doing, right? So, like, if I'm a, I'm a sysadmin by trade, mostly, I guess most of my career, software engineer and sysadmin, I care about the operating system because it's part of the things I got to care about. I still care about Kubernetes. I care, I mean, actually, with Kubernetes and, and containers, there's a lot more to care about, too. But I don't think anything went away, right? Like, I think there's just more stuff to worry about. So, all right, so, uh, yeah, I, I basically said, you know, Safety, I care about here. Probably road performance. At least this is a common thing in the U.S. People will go out and drive through the mountains, like, on the weekends. They care about their tires. If you blow out your tires driving through the mountains, you will die. Like, you'll slide off the road and die. Here, these people definitely care. And then here's where we should be, right? Like I said, this is really us, I think, the professionals. All right, so maybe I've convinced you you care a little bit. Like, uh, most of you already cared. But how many of you care now about the operating system? <laughs> I think it was all the same people. I don't think I've convinced anyone. <laughs> politics uh all right so what context though right um I, I i love showing this picture because i think i think this is this is this is actually a genius picture in that like people think that you know you like this is still more efficient than not doing that right like if there's a bunch of crap piled up on that boat it would be less efficient but this some crane probably put it in there right like so so that still went, you know, on a big ship and then into a smaller, sh you know, who knows what, onto a crane and then onto a truck and now it's on this boat for the last mile to maybe go to some island. Like, there's still, there's still something interesting about containers. I won't go on too much of a tangent about that, but I've always said it's a packaging format. I think that proves it. Um, all right, so there's a lot of different options. I mean, I work for Red Hat, but, but I still value all of these all of these Linux distributions, I'll say, and, and even Windows. I mean, at this point, you kind of have to say, well, if I'm running Windows, I need Windows containers. You have to kind of care about, you especially in Windows world have to care about what's in the container because they have to match. Um, you can't even have different versions. Like, there's no, there's no, there's no ability to, like, you know, leak. Um, but, but in the container world, how many of you are like, how many of you have been using, actually, let me, I guess, let me ask this. How many of you have used Docker? Vast majority. Uh, some of you have used Podman, I saw. How many of you have been using containers for more than three years? Decent amount. How many more than five? So a few. Yeah, it was us that were, like, talking about all this early on. Um, and how many of you more than a year? So actually, it looks like the last year shot up a decent amount. It looks like it almost doubled, if I were to take a quick estimate. So, like, we're still in that phase where people are figuring this out. So these are two of the common patterns that I've seen. And admittedly, as an old, like, curmudgeonly 
you know, old person now that I might not show off, but I am, I've been doing this way too long. I see people trying to reinvent the wheel. They, they look at these minimal options. This has become very popular in containers. And they'll say, well, we use distro -less. We don't want to use a Linux distro. Or they'll say, we start from scratch. And I'm like, eh. But then on the other hand, some people are, have common sense and they go, I'm just going to use a Linux distro. I'm going to use what is already there. I'm a Debian user. I want to put Debian in the container because now I can, you know, app get all the dependencies, blah, blah, blah. But there's two schools of thought happening. And I would say this is the hipster cool, and these are like the old curmudgeons, you know, in, I mean, in general, or people that just don't think about it. Um, but I, I, I would argue that it's still, it's still pretty valuable to think about this. All right. So I was joking. I had the sticker. I didn't put it on there. But there is no cloud, right? There's just someone else's computer. Have you all heard that? But there's also no distro list. There's only dependencies that you manage. So, like, you have to think about this. Like, actually, here's the funnier part. How many of you know about what distro list is? Have you heard about this? All right, do you know what they actually use? Mm, probably something big and done by It's a Debian dependency yeah. tree. They rely on the Debian Linux distro to do the work for them. And so it's funny because, like, I think it's almost like, I mean, it's, it's again, it's, it almost reminds me of politics in two, 2020. We say things like distro list. And I'm like, there's a whole team of people working on that behind the scenes, and you're basically minimizing, like, everything they do of value. But yet you're using it. Like, it's a complete insanity. Um, so hopefully I've caught you ahead of time before you see distro list, and now I've put you back on the right path. Uh, without, without, there's no such thing. Like, there is no such thing as distro list. All right, so why would we use a Linux distro? Um, you know, you would think through the standard reasons that you would use a Linux distro at, at, at all. Like, why would you use it in a container image? It's basically the same reasons. Um, you know, like, I mean, I try to boil these down. I mean, obviously, some of these get into, like, things Red Hat would think about more. But I think all these are pretty common among all the all the Linux distros, right? Like, size, like, what core utils does it use? What C library? Uh, what lifecycle? How long will they patch it? Like, how long will they patch what's in that container? Uh, people don't realize, like, when you go from... I, I ranted about this because on Docker Hub, the CentOS 7 and CentOS 8 container images are actually in the same repository. So if you're using the latest tag and you're building, like when CentOS 8 came out, all of your stuff probably just stopped working. And so you just did a Linux migration in like 10 minutes you know, or 5 minutes, however long it took to rebuild your containers. Um, this is something that people, it's hard for them to get their brain around. They don't realize, oh, every time I rebuild that container image, I'm essentially reinstalling an operating system. And then when I go from major version to major version, that's an actual upgrade. Like, I have to invest engineering time in going from, like, a major version of Linux to another major version of a Linux. And that doesn't, that, that could require reading tons of docs, figuring out they went from send mail to Postgres. I remember when that happened. Like, these kinds of things matter, right? Like, you have to think through this. So the life cycle in a container matters probably even more because I think like VMs, we probably get even lazier and we don't pay attention for a long time. And then eventually we're like, oh crap, the latest tag just pulled the latest version. Now I've got to figure out what's broken and why, you know, what, what programs changed. Um, so I think these are pretty important things to think about in containers. Uh, I mentioned security. You know, I go a step further and think about a security response team and like looking at it, I mean, I don't want to say anything bad, but different, different Linux distributions have different qualities there. Some are more re reputed in their ability to, you know, think about patching and like actually patching things. Other ones are less. So like, I think that's pretty important. Being able to like quickly track down, you know, when the security team comes to you and they scan your entire container environment, they're like, you have all these CVEs, you have to patch these things, you know, and that typical feedback thing that happens in any professional environment, that's going to happen with containers and it already is. Um, and then, Automate, I, you know, I talk about automated, you know, uh, automation and performance engineering, basically, like proactively going out and, and making sure, you know, I, I, I show a bunch of them here instead of just one because I think it's pretty funny. Um, but, but as you scale up and you have more containers, here's, here's, one of the, here's one of the weirdest problems that can happen in containers. And this is, I, I always find these edge cases and then they happen and then I laugh because I try to tell the world but they don't listen to me. Um, I, this is a problem. I haven't seen a BZ for it yet, although I've seen the BZs for all the other ones I've predicted so far. Um, uh, this one is going to happen soon where, like, you're building a web app, and you're building it, and you're running it on Kubernetes, and you, you're, you're, you're putting your performance at, say, 200 milliseconds. I need, the, I need the web server to respond in 200 milliseconds. And I fire up 10 containers, and I have a certain level of traffic load that's coming out and trying to connect to it. What happens when, like, three years from now, Kubernetes just kept firing up more containers. You're still getting a 200 millisecond response time, but now there's 72 containers. 
and you're like, wait, what, what happened to the, like, Kubernetes will just fire up more containers, even if, like, some performance went completely sideways inside of your container. You wouldn't even notice because it's just load balancing traffic. So, like, this is something that people are not thinking through, like, the glibc, the way the web server is compiled, all the standard stuff that we care about in Linux distros still matters in a container. In fact, it might even matter more because the platform will go fire up more of them and make things work, and next thing you'll know, you'll be spending way more money on Amazon because you have, like, 22 more, web, you know, 22 more, you know, virtual machines because you needed that much capacity because you had a performance hit, and, and Kubernetes just fixed it for you. Fixed it for you by adding more containers. So... So let's go into like how all this works so to remind you and go a step deeper. So this is where I'm going to hurt your brain a little bit. Um, we invented all of this a long, long time ago. I did, I, since only two of you were in Daniel's talk, he went through the entire history of like Unix to, to now, and we were messing with him afterwards. But I have a talk, I have a couple of blogs where I do go through this entire history. I will skip most of the history and come up to like 25-ish years ago. Um, the, the idea that we could... Um, so, so I, I show here, this is actually becoming a trendy thing to do in containers again, where people do scratch builds, what they'll call scratch builds. But nobody really knows what that means. Sometimes it means pulling binaries from a Linux distribution and running them, you know, basically stuffing them or putting them in the container. But then other times it means compiling like a C app or a G, or like a Golang app, which we have a lot of in our container team because there's a lot of tools in the container world that are written in Golang and Golang is compiled. Um, the, this is like, seems like a really good idea at first. You're like, oh, uh, this gets the smallest container image possible, right? Because I get a very small binary if I compile everything statically, like, and I, and I don't have any dynamic linking. Um, and all I need is glibc or golang or something like that, and I can compile it in, and I come out with a real small binary, and then I stuff that binary in a container. Uh, but, but this has some really strange caveats in that, one, if I have 5,000 containers in my environment, I now have 5,000 glibcs embedded everywhere, and I have 5,000 different SSLs, you know, lib SSLs embedded everywhere. And now we get into the nuanced problem of attack surface. People think it's the container image. They'll do this very not smart thing where they'll look at the container image. They're like, this container image is bigger than this container image, so this one has less attack surface. And that's actually not the way you should look at it. You should think about all of the containers in your environment and think about the attack surface of all of that. And if you have... 200 different teams using two different, 200 different versions of libssl and 200 versions of lib glibc, now you have a much larger attack surface because the hacker does not care about that one container. They're trying to get into your entire environment. Their target is the environment. So the more different containers with different versions of glibc and libssl in them, the, the worse this is going to be, right? So many years ago, we solved this problem um, by doing dynamic linking. Um, and what we do here, I show in this example, is I'm compiling... Uh, Apache, and for those of you that don't remember this, what happens when you dynamically compile a binary is you add ld.so. Basically, you statically compile in ld.so, and then when you run the binary, the Linux operating system is smart enough to analyze the ELF binary and go, oh, this, is, this has a dynamic linker, and then the linker at runtime will go out and find the dependencies on the disk. I don't know how many of you remember this, but this goes back to computer science, like back 20 years from me. Um, now, the beauty of this is we've turned on more technologies, and, and I'm showing you kind of like how we get to a container and then like which technologies get turned on as we get into this. And this is all about, I should have explained this at the beginning, but this is, I'm going to build up a container image and kind of go further and further and further until we truly have a container. Um, but now we're using, you know, we're using ELF binaries, we're using glibc, you know, GCC and then, and glibc inside, and then we're using LD. Um, and now we start to go, okay, now this is cool because if, you know, libssl or, or, uh, glibc need patch because there's some security problem or some performance problem, I can patch it. I can patch it without basically recompiling the app every time. But I still have to rebuild the container every time. Um, so there's, there's still a problem there. And then we've also introduced a new problem of now we have dependencies. We have to figure out how to get these dependencies on disk inside the container image. So now basically we've said, oh, well now we need to build something called a depth solver, right? Oh, well in this case Red Hat World, it's yum and and RPM, and then I turn on this technology that I call Linux Distro. Linux Distro is a bunch of human beings that, that have subject matter expertise in a bunch of different pieces of software. They compile all of this software into one giant repository, and then they build out all the dependencies for that. And it's a nightmare. And honestly, like, except for operating system people and Linux Distro people, nobody wants to do that work, right? Like, as a developer, I'm trying to build a PHP app. I don't want to do that. 
Um, I don't want to have to go hunt down all the like glibc dependencies or the libssl dependencies, things like that. It's a nightmare. So um, we've now solved that problem, but now we have a Linux distro. We're back to having a Linux distro inside of the container image because I want to have that dependency tree, basically. But that only solves the, the bottom up part of the problem inside of the container image. We still have to worry about like PHP, you know, our Python or, or NPM for Node. We still typically end up layering on some kind of, con, you know, application on top, like, like Perl, Python, Ruby, PHP, blah, blah, blah. And almost all of these languages have their own dependency, their own depth solver, and their own, you know, supply chain of, you know, dependencies. And there's teams that go and analyze and, you know, basically manage all that. And that's a ton of work. Um, so now you're getting into, I got two different dependency trees. I have Linux distro and then I have some language, maybe multiple. Um, and now I have, you know, depth solvers for both. And I have to have access to all of this tooling at the time that I'm building the container image, basically. It's almost like, an, again, you're kind of back to an operating system install. But uh, we go one more layer. So this is really where we get into, like, the technologies that are, truly make a container, right? Because if you think about what a container is, it's, it's not much. It's a tar file. And it's got a config file, and that's about it. And, uh, and, and you could have multiple tar files depending on how many layers you have. And then I joke here, you know, we have the, the Open Containers Initiative governs the specification. It's an open, how, I don't know how much, how many of you do, do you know what OCI is? Not many? Okay. So Open Containers Initiative is managed by the Linux Foundation. It is an open governing board that basically dictates, not dictates, but governs the um, the format of container images and actually runtimes, and they actually have a like sort of a reference implementation of the runtime standard, which is Run C, which I don't go deep in this talk. But this organization is really cool, and that Docker gave this to to this organization. There was some politics at the beginning to get this to happen, but luckily it did happen. And so now, at least in the container format world, we're never going to end up with RPM and Deb. We won't have a split thing. At least everybody's going to use the same OCI spec. And, and there have actually been a few others, like how many of you have heard of Singularity? Singularity is another different format. LXC has its own stuff, or LXD has their own thing. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so there's still people nibbling at doing other things, but I can tell you right now, at Red Hat, we are doing this. Like, this is the one that, that everything else... It, there are there are down there are downsides to the specification. I, Alex Sarai from Seuss has a great talk where he talks about all the downsides of the current technology that we selected for basically container images, and he has all of these solutions. But it's going to be like the next 20 years to get any of them done because we have a working standard. Um, I'm even seeing in my world where people are less interested in singularity and more interested in OCI containers, especially in the last year. Like it started to change. Whereas before, I think people didn't they didn't realize. The beauty of having one container spec is that I can have one piece of infrastructure. I can have one registry server that has everything in it. In fact, we even, I think CNV or Kubert can even pull virtual machine images from within a uh, within a, an OCI, basically, image file. And I know for a fact CoreOS in OpenShift 4, I don't, I don't know how many of you have heard of CoreOS, but it's the, it's the basically distribution of RHEL that we snapshot for OpenShift. And uh, it's a it's a read only operating system. It actually pulls down its updates as container images, lays them out on disk, and then updates the OS. So like we're moving to this for a, basically. If you look at OpenShift 4, it needs one thing: it needs a container registry. That's all it needs to manage OpenShift. It even manages the operating system updates as container images. So, but this can, these container images are basically a bunch of metadata and some architecture specific stuff, all stuffed in a config file. Um, and then basically we, we basically just put that in with the image layer side by side and then the container engine, which I won't go deep into it, but when it pulls down the container uh, image and runs it, it knows how to digest, digest these variables that the image builder has put inside of the container image. Um, but now this is kind of all the technologies working together to make something, you know, basically a manageable container image that will work, that will be constructive and we can use over, a, over an operational life cycle like three years or two years or five years or longer sometimes. I, 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 still, I still hold to the fact that people will use technology more than they, for a longer period than they want to. Like the container world ha is under this impression that we, we move fast so we will only have things for like a year or six months. But in reality, I guarantee there will be container images that are like 10 years old and they'll keep rebuilding them until till whatever bits you have in there are not updatable anymore. All right, so then the, this opens us up. The fact that containers are also layerable. So, so the way container images work is that, that config file 
points to like what layers make up that container image. And then when the container engine goes and pulls down that config file, and it looks and it says, oh, I need this layer, this layer, this layer, it pulls those layers down, and then it lays them over each other. So like, if you want to delete a file, you actually have to, it, it, this is another one that Alexis Rye does, he rants about it, he's like, when you want to delete a file, the container image doesn't get smaller, it gets bigger. Because you have to write metadata saying you deleted the file in the layer below. So, like, say you have a five gig, you know, ISO image in the in the base image, and then you delete it in another container, you know, layer on top. You will now have five gigs still there, plus like the the metadata pointing back that says, "Hey, I deleted the five gig file." It doesn't go away. So, there's some there's some good and bad things to this. Um, you can do things, and I'll show you at the end where you can delegate to different specialists. Like, say. Historically, we've always had sort of sysadmins, DBAs, Java specialists. You can start to delegate some of the work in different layers to different teams and let them add things. But it also has some downsides if you don't do it right. So in this one, I point out, I don't have names for all these problems, but this is like the, this is like the I've, I've overwritten something without realizing it, and I've actually increased my attack surface. So in this one, what I'm showing is, is this person built a container image on top of this person's. So like this might be like the operating system team built some base image. Then this team came in and built another one that where they overwrite wrote Apache or Nginx. And then but they didn't overwrite glibc, so at least if I go, if the if this team goes and patches glibc, this team will inherit it. But then this team said they needed some other libssl that was newer that had some or compiled in a different way that had some other encryption options or who knows what. And then this team needed a different glibc for who knows why. And the problem here now is, is that like when this person rebuilds libssl, this person doesn't get that update. And when this person re you know, rebuilds GLBC, this person doesn't. And so this image might have CVEs that show up that aren't in this one and aren't in this one and aren't in this one. And so you end up with this layering problem where you have this like cascading effect. And uh, you have to really think through this. And I've seen, I've seen some organizations have very, very complex supply chains where it might be you know, 35 different you know, branches to the tree and they're very complex and then they have to figure out what it, in secure, computer security we would call non-repudiation where this team says, we didn't add it, it must have been the team ahead of us, and it has some Trojan in the image, right? And then you're like, who added it? You can only point to the next person in the chain and say, it was somebody above me, it wasn't me. And uh, there's, no, there's plausible deniability if you don't have basically non-repudiation. So sometimes people will do things like put a signed file in that container image layer to verify, essentially to verify that that team actually put that together. It's not super perfect, but it's better than having no idea who did what. Um, so, so this is kind of what the container images in their full glory look like. So, also, I already talked through layers, um, but with image layers, you basically get to communicate to the end user, you know, like what, what these different layers mean. And you can think about these as basically human constructs, right? Like, these are arbitrary. There's no, the OCI doesn't govern what you put in these images. So I've seen people do nasty stuff where they have like Apache configured one way and Apache configured another way. And they branch and it'll be like Apache 1, Apache 2, and they'll have like different configs embedded in this. You can do that. I would not recommend it, but you can do that. Um, this latest tag is the only one that's governed, but these don't have to be numbers. In this case, I show that. And I try to explain this as this is a, a way for the container image builder to communicate to the container image consumer how they should consume the image. And really what this is is about simplifying the, the, the API surface of the thing that you're getting, right? You're like, hey, here's a container image. I, I don't know which layers are usable, you know, but there could be 25 layers, but I'm going to label a few of them so that the end user knows how to, you know, what they should be consuming and why. It makes it more intuitive. Um, and I already talked about... Um, you know, like these layers kind of come together, and then I give a quick overview here of like how this gets at runtime what happens. So this is the container engine. This is Docker or Podman or Cryo. Um, Cryo, has, Cryo, any container engine has three jobs basically. It's um, it's basically to build this config file is one of the main jobs, and what it does to do to build this config file that then gets handed off to Run C to then basically talk to the kernel and run a container is it actually uses the default variables that were embedded inside the container image. And then it will add user options. So, like, say you say podman run dash p 8080 colon 80, and you, like, map port 8080 to 80 when you're running the container image. That's basically these user options that would override any port settings that maybe you had embedded in the container image. And then the engine itself will add all kinds of other things, like SE Linux rules or set comp rules. Or there's all, if you look at a config file, for, which I don't do a demo in this one, but if you look at a config file, it's, you know, 
400 lines long and it has all these set comp rules and all these things that the container engine itself adds in. And then, and then finally, it passes this config file off to run C, which I mentioned is the, the OCI uh, reference implementation for container runtime. And both Podman and Docker and Cryo, all three of them use, and container D. Basically, everybody in the world uses run C. And so you hand this config file off to run C, and then run C talks to the kernel to fire up a container. Um, I, I, I kind of mentioned that already, but, but I also show here how it can get you know, in this one, I, I showed basically a, a smaller tree, but this is getting now what it really starts to look like in a real environment, right? Like we may have like a, a um, operating systems team that kind of builds a base image, you know, basically pulls down, say, a Debian image or a Fedora image or CentOS or whatever, rel, and then add some things that they think they want that are kind of standard things that they'd like to have. Um, and then, you know, you start to specialize. Like, this might be an Apache team. This might be an Nginx team. This might be a MySQL team. Um, and this is where we start to, like, break things out, you know, by SMEs, right? But as you start, the reason why I'm boring you with all of these details is, is you start to realize there's a lot of other problems I should be working and thinking about than just, like, like I shouldn't be, like, questioning whether I'm going to use Yum and... Ruby gems and NPN, right? I should be thinking. There's, I have to think through all these layers of things. And to be very honest, I'd rather spend more of my time here. I'd rather spend more of my time, like setting up a CI/CD system and figuring out how I can make this like CentOS container image build over and over for five years without having to think about it. And so, like, that's where I got to the like the life cycle matters because the life cycle of the Linux distro in the container image essentially governs how long I can let this thing run in a CI/CD system, constantly rebuilding and always like actually having the updates it needs to have security performance, et cetera. But in a nutshell, I want to focus. I want to focus most of my time and attention up here, not down here. So obviously, like, an operating system still matters even in a container image. All right. So I mentioned like some of the problems that like these things solve, right? Though the just having a container image starts to help the works on my laptop problem because I did bundle all those things together, right? Like I bundled the, you know, the PHP and everything together. And I, if I test that construct, that I call it like a jiggly stack of software, right? Like all the different versions of these things can change. But once I've cement them in a container image, at least I know I snapshot it. It's almost like a core build like we used to do back in the day or we still do. Um, you know, but I have it saved forever. And then I can run on my laptop moved into production, I pretty much know it's going to work. Like, I pretty much know it's going to work. There's some caveats depending on people will mix and match. I'm not a big fan of that. They'll be running, like, Ubuntu here, and they'll run RHEL here. I'm not a big fan of that because if you're running binaries from one Linux distro on another, I do prefer, let's say, in this scenario, you're using a, you know, a Red Hat Universal base image on an Ubuntu laptop, and then you move it over to RHEL. I like that better than going the other way. Because, like, if it ran on Ubuntu in development, it will only run as good or better on the operating system that it was basically compiled on. And so I think there's, a, there's less danger going from, like, something that wasn't compatible to something that we know is for sure compatible. But going the other way, I think, is a very dangerous way. Like, like I suggest people, I typically suggest to people to, you know, if you're going to have an Ubuntu server, run an Ubuntu server image because you know those binaries were compiled to that kernel and you know all the, like, for example, with RHEL, SE Linux, everything is dialed in. Everything is like the way it should be in those binaries. And so you know things won't break, which we've seen that happen. That's probably been the biggest. One of the problems I saw was like a, a, an Ubuntu image was ran on Ubuntu, and then they moved it over to CentOS in production. And the CentOS had SE Linux turned on. And then basically the binaries that were compiled in Ubuntu actually had SE Linux options on, which nobody knew. And then they like came on and broke the binaries. But there was no way to like change it around and in, in the container image because the tools were not there. Does that make sense to everyone? So another problem I mentioned was, I mentioned the, my, you know, my containers, like I'm in a big Kubernetes environment and they just keep scaling out, right? Like, and I could still get, like, say when I first put the application into production, I need a million transactions per second. Um, you know, I might be able to achieve that on day one, but how do I maintain like a million transactions per second? And, and, you know, like I mentioned, on day one, I might deploy a 1,000 containers to achieve a million transactions per second. That's the way you start to think in a Kubernetes environment. But then, like, three years from then, I might have, like, 1,500 containers running to get the same million transactions per second. And nobody will ever notice. No, there's no, like, monitoring or fault, you know, management that we use that would ever catch that. That would just be, like, decay in whatever you had in that container image. You might have made a config file change at some point that then made it need 
you know, made it need 33% more resources. Or you might have made some SSL change that was like, you know, caused it to use a different algorithm that was less efficient. Or the operating system could have updated a binary in there and then things broke down the road and caused it to use more, you know, resources. So this, these problems get very tricky when you start to move them into, into, you know, essentially a distributed systems environment like Kubernetes. And so again, I, I suggest offloading that problem to an operating system or to like a Linux distro because a Linux distro is good at doing this already. Um, another one is is I, you know I have the million transactions per second, then I have the hacker. Um, works on my laptop doesn't help you with performance or security. Like just because it works on your laptop does not mean it doesn't get hacked two seconds after you put it into production, right? So how do you how do you even how do you even have any kind of warm and fuzzy feeling that it's not going to get hacked? You, know, you can, like, compile it yourself and be like, well, I think I know this stuff pretty well. Or you can use something that, like, a Linux distro is already building, and you're like, well, there's a whole bunch of other people using it, and they're not getting hacked. So now I have precedent that I probably won't get hacked also. So it's another nuanced reason to think about using a, you know, a, a Linux distro in the container image. Um, and then here I just break out, you know, there's a whole bunch of other user space things you need to think about uh, with performance, especially, like, compute, you know. There's a ton of work that goes into Linux distros to make sure that basically all of these capabilities remain the same. So, like, like in any Linux distro, when they, they bring it together for the next version, they basically compile, you know, things with glibc or whatever compiler they use. Um, and then you, like, start to, like, make little tweaks and kind of set a baseline of performance for all these things. Um, if you are, again, doing all this from scratch, every time, you're ba every time you basically make a little tweak to it, it's almost like you just create a new operating system. So if, you, if you're back in that model where you're like, eh, we're going to compile everything ourselves, do all this ourselves, manage all these things, and you, man you give that all to the app team, every different container image in your environment is going to have different, essentially different performance characteristics with all of these things. And that can become pretty cognitively, that can be a pretty heavy cognitive load, and it can just be inefficiency. Again, you're, it's not attack surface, it's like work surface or maintenance surface. You're creating a huge maintenance surface because all these different container images may have different performance characteristics, which will inevitably bite you, you know, down the road when, when it's in production. Three years from now when that team's gone and they don't even know how it works anymore. And it's just sitting there in a CICD system being rebuilt, and you're like, hey, it works kind of, like, but I don't know what it is. Um, it's a bad place. I, I already predict this is, this is happening to people that have done this. Um, I talk a little bit about Red Hat Universal Base Image. I won't go deep, but, but, but uh, Red Hat saw this problem. Like, so RHEL, historically, we had always charged a subscription for, right? And so this container world turned my world upside down, and this has been my life for like the last year and a half, um, or about a year, uh, in, that, in that we had to figure out how to basically put some RHEL bits out there so people could use them to basically do all the things I just said, rely on a Linux distro inside of the container image, while still being able to redistribute the Linux image. Whereas, like, historically, Red Hat had not let people redistribute RHEL. We basically used the trademarks. It was kind of the only way that we could enforce our business model uh, that basically allowed a contractual agreement. Because the way Red Hat's business works is we just, there's no legality. Like, like the customer could totally share their, their, their stuff wherever they want, but they sign a contract that says they won't, and we sign a contract that says we'll give you support as long as we both agree to this contract. That's basically the only enforcement we have. Um, so we basically created this thing called Red Hat Universal Base Image that changes that end user license agreement to allow people to redistribute them. And we did in introduce like Node.js and Java and PHP. Actually, we're introducing Java soon. Uh, PHP, um, uh, a whole bunch of different language runtimes, and then a bunch of, we have sort of three standard base images, a minimal one, one that you can run systemd inside the container image. How many of you would think about running systemd in a container image? All right, so some people are pretty pragmatic. Personally, I, I, I actually defend this, even though, again, I'm kind of a curmudgeon, but there's a lot of you know, subject matter expertise built into that. And if you've, ever, if you've ever been tasked with building a container image for some piece of software that you don't know, and then you have to figure out how to get it to start up with a single line, it's really annoying. So like Apache, you can run like HDBD dash D background, and there's a few command line options you can pass that daemon to run, but it's annoying, because I don't want to go into the system D file and like find out how you start all these different pieces of software that I'm running in container. It's much easier in a container image build to do yum install Apache, system ctl enable HDBD. And to be honest with you, I even run mine, I run even like my blog and all my stuff as essentially system D uh, ran Apache that just starts with like two commands, and then I actually run them read only. So I actually get systemd and Apache running in a container read only, and so like it's pretty secure. Like it's definitely more secure than running on a regular web server. So these, 
this does not preclude doing really serious security things, even if you're running like system D. And anybody that says system D eats up a bunch of resources is probably crazy. Like it's not like running an Apache and then system D side by side for the small scale I'm doing is not a big deal. Um, anyway, so let's get to, uh, we're getting down to the end here, but, but let's, let's go with some district, well, actually before I even give any recommendations, because this is my world now we're getting into where I'm constantly thinking about this stuff, but how many of you are actually involved in a Linux distro, like contribute to one? Okay, so a decent amount. So I'm curious, like, have those of you that do, how many of you have seen similar problems, like, from your users asking about things in the container image? Has anyone asked anything? A little bit? All right, a little bit. But you're kind of looking, eh, not that much. Are, are, you, are those of you that are working on this thinking about specific uh, features or, or changes that you can make to your Linux distro to make it run better in a Linux, in a, in a container image? Raise your hand if you're doing that. So some, okay. Yeah, and I would say I'm in that boat. I'm thinking about things, and we do certain things, but it's still pretty much a regular Linux, like root FS, basically, for this, at this point, for the most part, uh, even for us. So, I, I, again, I, uh, I, I, I decided to put up something funny to show, like, how containers happen, basically. Um, I'll let you read it for a second. This is basically what we did with containers, right? Like we just glued two two phones together to make a tablet because we wanted to split screen, right? Like we, it's still basically a regular operating system inside the container image, uh, and we're not doing that much. And we're just gluing new stuff together in a slightly different way. Some tar files and some config files. That's basically what we added to this whole magic. Um, so, I guess especially the other people that work on distros, um, like the call to action, I think, is first off all of us telling the world the same thing. Like telling people that this still does matter and having confidence that it matters. I noticed early on at Red Hat, because I've been doing this like six years-ish, um, I would say early on some of our packagers and stuff didn't fully feel confident that this mattered. Like I would say we kind of slapped some things together in containers early on, and then we eventually built out an entire huge team to like handle all this. But I was like the Cassandra whining early on that this is going to go sideways if we don't think about it. Um, especially container image rebuilds, because it takes a lot of image rebuilds when you get into these layers like this. I mean, Red Hat has a, a several million container image builds per month, probably, we're in that scale. I mean, it's a huge environment. We don't actually talk about it publicly a lot, but we could easily do, like, one of those high-scalability blog entries on how we do all of our container image builds. It gets huge. Um, but I think, I think all of us should be telling the world that this still matters. Like the dependency tree that we build matters and like the value, the quality of that dependency tree and all the subject matter expertise for all of those packagers matters. Um, you know, like our, our packager on our subsystem team, I, I work on the container subsystem in RHEL, but like our packagers know how to build Podman better than other people know how to build Podman because they build it all the time and they know like all the little secrets to make Podman run better in the way that we want it to run. And that's true for like Bind and Apache and like every other like, you know, type of software that you put in there. And then you scale that out across an entire Linux distro and now you're talking thousands of pieces of software. So I would say my call to action for or ask for everyone, you know, is like, Think through that and, like, tell the world that your stuff still matters. Like, don't let people say that, you know, it doesn't matter. Then the second thing I would say is let's think about, like, features that we can add to our, to our Linux distros, basically, that will start to make it more optimized for container images. There's all kinds of things that we're thinking through right now. Like, um, for example, like, uh, I would say... Uh, MySQL is a perfect example. There's a bunch of environment variables that, like, the official MySQL image or the official MariaDB image will accept. Like, you could pass the database user the database password. There's, like, probably, I don't know, 10-ish different environment variables. We should all start to think about how the Linux distro can do that out of the box, like, for Apache. Like, imagine if you could set, like, the the uh, encryption algorithms that you want to use or the security level of the container image. Those are, like, really nice to have things that I think probably the Linux distro should start to think about doing. Um, you know, again, optimizing tooling. You know, for example, we have FIPS compliance is a perfect example for us, for Red Hat. We have to be able to turn on, like, the FIPS algorithms inside the container image. And we do it, actually, by setting some variables in the host, and then the container engine is smart enough to basically know that and then run the container image in a certain way. But this requires a lot of moving parts. It's the way the container... The, basically, the way the container engine is built and compiled and configured, and it's also the way the container images are built and compiled and configured. And so you end up with this dependency tree where you can make things kind of magically happen and make them a lot easier. Um, you know, I would say same defaults are another thing. Like, 
like making sure that these things come up in the right way and start in the right way that would be good for a container image. Think about another one is minimization. I think a lot of us, anybody that's probably doing this, you, the ones that raise your hand, like minimization is probably the biggest one that I hear among the dependency tree. And we're working on that. I don't know how many of you are from Fedora, but we're working on that upstream. Adam Samalik is working on a minimization effort upstream because the way Red Hat does everything, we just do it upstream. So probably around the RHEL 9 time frame, you'll see this work end up arriving in RHEL. But I would say that's a huge one where we really want to optimize the dependency graph, basically, so that we can have loose or weak dependencies and then make things smaller and maybe even break up some of the packages in new ways. So, like, maybe... Uh, you know, libssl, we can break it out, or especially glibc is one that we can break out into different things, different, we did it a little bit with like languages, so the lang packs, we have like a, a default minimal language pack that we can pull in with glibc to make it smaller, but we want to do more and more stuff like that. Uh, but I guess my call to action to everyone, especially the ones that work on distros, is let's all start thinking about this stuff and like make our stuff relevant in this future world, because it annoys me when people say that operating systems don't matter. I think there's a ton of work to do here. And so with that, I will, uh, I will leave you with my Twitter and some other stuff I wrote. I publish a lot, a lot. So, like, if you Google me, I write, like, all kinds of crazy stuff about this. I probably publish, I don't know, 20 blog entries a year, 30 blog entries a year or something. But um, I would love to continue the conversation if you want to chat about it. And uh, I will leave it to questions if anyone wants to do any questions or even thoughts, especially the, the, the other distro maintainers. I'm curious. That is hard. Yeah, yeah, I'll repeat. I'm sorry. So he said, he said they're having actually a problem. So there's a problem to use the latest tag or not to use the latest tag. Um, if the end user that pulls down the container image specifies a, a, a essentially a tag, um, on whether it's the latest or not latest, you get burned one way or the other. What happens is, is if they pull the latest, it will constantly break them, possibly. But if they pull down a static, like version 1.2, you know, like if they pull down a static version, the, that image, I say container images age like cheese, not like wine. And so they will end up picking up CVEs over time. And then they complain no matter what you do. Like, like they want, so the, the short answer there is it's a hard problem to solve. Red Hat solves it because we do ABI API compatibility over a life cycle. So we guarantee, so like if you pull down a rel 7 image, or it will stay rel 7 forever. And it keeps getting CVEs, but it doesn't break anything but it's a hard problem to solve. That's a lot of investment, like, and that's kind of why we do it. But that's the only way I know to solve that problem. How are you taking the stable time? I'm sorry, say one more. Yeah, and, well, that's what I'm basically, that's essentially what I'm doing, yeah. Oh, sorry, so he's, it wasn't a question, but I'll repeat. He said, he said you can stay on the stable branch. So, for example, with Podman upstream, we have stable branches that we actually rebase down into rel, we basically just follow those stable branches. And if there's a CVE, we'll patch the CVE there, and then anybody can pull it. So, like, even SUS contributes a lot to Podman, but they can just pull down the stable version. That is one way to solve it, that, that hopefully the upstream will maintain those CVEs. There's, for some things, you can probably do that, like MySQL and other things. Any other questions? Crazy stuff. Yep. Oh, so, okay, so this question is around host and container image compatibility, which I love ranting about, and HPC proves it. Um, and what they do, what he said, is they basically will bind mount in things like the MPI library or glibc from the host. They may, like, have a directory that has, like, a specific version of glibc or the MPI libraries built, or, like, Cray has their own MPI library, and then you have to, like, use that one. Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. They're yeah. <laughs> so... 
So the question is, how? what are we doing? And I, I may know you by your question. Like, I, I think I might know who you are. Have you ever been on a call for, for, the, for the, like, Sandia Labs and all those That's HPC it, things? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So I may have talked to you before. This sounds like such a familiar problem. But the question is, what is Red Hat doing to try to make the better? Well, it's kind of the same answer as the last question. Like, what we do is try to maintain that ABI API compatibility. So at least if it's a REL 8 or, you know, UBI 8 image on REL 8, that should work, right? Like, like even if you're using the underlying host, glibc, everything should work. And then hopefully the ecosystem of REL is big enough to attract, like, the hardware and all that stuff so it will enable it, right? And we are doing a lot of that in OpenShift and in REL. No, no, there's an ABI, I'm like, there's... Yeah, so his question is, is, is there a way to, like, basically compare two ABIs and kind of diff them? Yeah, you guys have Abigail. Okay. We do have some kind of tooling to do that. Um, I think we mostly do it to check old versions against newer versions to make sure we didn't break the compatibility, but I don't see why you couldn't use it to compare two different container images. Um, I know Carlos O'Donnell is a, is a really good guy to talk to about that. He's a Red Hat guy that's a glibc maintainer. And I know he talks about this all the time. This is, like, deep in his area. I don't know that we've built anything that we expose to end users to do that, but we definitely do it internally. <laughs> we definitely do it in between, like, rel versions and, and, and things like that. So you could probably use that. I'm, actually, I'm sure if you Google, we, we talk about it publicly, but admittedly, I haven't gotten deep in that. Well, that's an interesting one. We should chat more about that one. I think we are, we should probably wrap it up. So thank you everyone.